Jesus chooses to love me. I can't earn it. Jesus loved me regardless of my sin. Romans 5, 8 says, But God proves his own love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus chose to die for me. John 15, 13 says, No one has greater love than this, to lay down his life for his friends. Heavenly Father, we praise you. We thank you for the blessing of gathering here in your house. We're thankful, Lord God, for all these who have joined us uh, for our, our worship rally for Vacation Bible School. And Lord God, I pray that everything that is said and done will glorify you, that we would lift up the name of Jesus and be drawn closer in our relationship with him just for being here today. And so thank you, Lord God, for the blessing of serving you. Bless this time we have together, for it's in the precious and powerful name of Jesus we do pray. Amen. I do want to welcome you to First Baptist Church to our, our Vacation Bible School Worship Rally. Now listen, they gave me an apron to wear, but they didn't give me no tools. I don't think they trusted me with a hammer or a saw. But I'm so glad they've got here, and I'm glad you're here to join us as we worship God. Uh, Miss Patricia is going to share with us a little bit about Vacation Bible School and what took place for the last five weeks. Jesus will always love me. We will say Philippians 1, 6 together. I am sure this, that he who started a good work in you will start to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Philippians 1, 6. Very good. We have had a wonderful time over the last few weeks having Vacation Bible School, and there are a number of people that I want to thank. I made a list because I certainly don't want to leave anyone out. I'd like to thank our staff, and especially Mary. Mary has been an unofficial co-director this year. I want y'all to give Mary a, a hand, please. <laughs> Mary is a full-time volunteer in our office, and y'all just would not believe the number of things that Mary takes care of. She is always willing to go above and beyond to serve anyone in this church. Okay? I'd like to also thank our teachers, the workers, the parents, grandparents and relatives who've helped get children here for practice and for vacation Bible school. I'd like to thank my husband. He works behind the scenes. Y'all need to give him a hand, too, because he puts up with me. We had some youth helpers who came down each week and helped us in the hideout when we had Vacation Bible School. I really appreciate their help. They are great leaders, y'all. They have been trained well, and they do a wonderful job. For those of you who have prayed, I want to thank you. For those who, who led our Bible stories, we had new teachers come in this year and help, and we have new people who have signed to help coming up in the future. For those who helped with safety and with snacks, for those who helped with crafts and games, 
and also for any of you who gave to our toolbox mission. We collected mission items that will be used to help children around this community and around the world. We collected items for Operation Christmas Child. We collected items for the homeless, and you were part of that. This year, we've really been learning about building on the love of Jesus, and you've demonstrated that love over these past few weeks in the way that you've supported these children and provided Vacation Bible School, even in a time of a pandemic. You have showed that love to these children and through these boxes to other children and people around the world. You've shown these children that they're important to you, that they're loved, that they're loved by God and they're loved by this church, and I thank you. We've been looking at Ephesians 3 as a prayer for the children over the last few weeks. We've prayed specifically that Christ would dwell in their hearts by faith, that they would understand the big love of Jesus, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We've prayed that they would understand a love that surpasses knowledge, for we know that no greater love than this than to, for someone to lay down his life for us, and Jesus did that. And we've prayed that they are filled with the fullness of Jesus Christ so that we can take that love that he pours out into us and we can pour it out into this community as we go. Whether you're three or 33 or 53 or 103, God's word is for you and it's never changing. The words of Philippians 1, 6 are for you and they are a promise that never changes. God started a good work in you and he will complete it. We're going to do a song, and I want to show you the motions. I'm going to sit down and do it in front of the children, but I want you to do the motions with them. They're going to help teach you this song. The words repeat, and it's, I know that God, so hold your hands up, God, and for started a good work, you're going to hammer. So God started a good work in me, and he will complete it. Okay, so the song goes, God started a good work in me and he will complete it so you just follow along if you get lost in there it's okay just jump right back in we're going to have a great time with this song and we're going to do one other song for you
Jan As Miss Patricia was sharing with you about Vacation Bible School, one person was left off, and that is Miss Patricia. How grateful we are she's here to, to lead our children and to serve God by serving others. So let's go ahead and give Miss Patricia a wonderful round of applause. Thank you. I am glad that you've come to join us to worship this morning. The kids have done a wonderful job in leading us in worship. Um, I was told many years ago, and I believe this to be true, that if you want to aim at the heart of a man, then aim at the head of a child. What is meant by that is anatomically that could be correct. In other words, a child probably stands about the height where it would be of a, uh, an, a, an average adult's heart. But it really means sometimes to reach adults, you need a very simple message. Uh, this morning I want to share with you about Jesus what they've been studying all week long, and really this is the children's message. You just happen to get to be along for the ride. And so I just want to share with them this morning as well as you. Uh, let me ask all you children a couple questions. Are you ready? Have you ever been in church and you sang a song and you heard the word sung and you were like, why on earth are we singing that? You know, you just didn't understand why we were singing it. Let me give you an example. The title of the message I want to share this morning is really simple. What can wash away the sin, my sins? But the song goes like this. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. If I was a stranger in town and I knew nothing about Jesus, nothing knew, uh, about Christianity, and I came into a church and they sang that song, I'd be like, what are you talking about? You're not going to wash yourself with somebody else's blood. And so the message this morning, I believe, helps us to understand why we sing a song such as that. Now, what was your theme? Go ahead. This is for you guys to answer. Are you ready? What was your theme throughout all of this five weeks of Vacation Bible School? Think about it. How about it? it started with building on? What was your theme? You can say it. Don't be afraid. Building on the love of Jesus. I want to begin this morning by really bringing one message or one uh, verse to mind. And uh, as is our tradition, I want all of us to stand as I read or quote John 3, 16. You see, if we're going to be talking about what can wash away our sins, if we're going to talk and finish a vacation Bible worship rally, talking about the love of Jesus, everything being built on Jesus, I believe where we need to turn is right there to John 3, 16. The Word of God says this, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we praise you this morning. And as these wonderful children have learned over the last five weeks about building upon the love of your precious Son, our Lord and Savior, we cannot help but go to John 3, 16, where your, your Son, our Savior, tells us that you love the world so much that he came to give his life for us. And so as we take a closer look of what it means to be washed by the blood of your son, by our Lord and Savior Jesus, I pray that you'll speak to each of our hearts from the oldest adult to the youngest child. Bless this time together, for it's in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. I'm going to, uh, please be seated. I, I've got a, a couple of uh, jars I'm going to be showing you in just a moment that I believe is going to help us uh, get to understand just a little bit of what it means by being washed by the blood of the Lord. What it means that Jesus gave his life, that love that he has, has, has given to us in John 3, 16. When you think about this wonderful passage, in order to understand the love of Jesus, you have to ask the question, well, wait a second, why does God love us? You have to ask the question in, in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So you have to ask the question, why did 
God have to give his son? Why did Jesus have to come? And it really takes us all the way back to Genesis chapter 1. You see, God's love is found all the way from the very beginning to the end, from creation to the consummation. And we begin in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, where it says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. God, because of his love for us, simply created the heavens and earth. And then in the midst of that creation, listen, he created me and he created you. He created mankind. In fact, it says in, in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 27, it says that he created us in his image. God created us so that we can have a personal relationship with him. I just find that amazing. That's the love of God all the way back from the very beginning. So here's the first jar I want to share with you. It is simply a jar that represents you and me. God created you. God created me. And he simply did it because he loves the world. Again, I just find that amazing. He created us in his image. We are created for a personal relationship with you. You know, King David understood that. King David, you remember him. Who, if, over here, if you're a child over here, look over here. If you remember King David from the Bible, just raise your hand. Remember King David? Come on. He, David who slew the, the giant. Yeah, and he was a shepherd boy and he became a king. Yeah, that's right. Remember King David? Not only was he a shepherd, a king, a warrior, King David was a poet. He was a songwriter. He was a musician. And King David wrote, if you look in the Psalms, many of the Psalms that we read in the book of Psalms. He wrote one Psalm called Psalm 139, where he talks about the wonderful eternal powers of God, and he talks about God's creation. Listen to what David wrote. Psalm 139, verse 14. He says, I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works and that my soul knows very well. David understood that he was important to God. And what I'm trying to let you help you to understand is that you are important to God. How many people have looked in the mirror? You've looked in the mirror. How about you out there? You've looked in the mirror, right? What do you see when you look in a mirror? Your reflection, right? You look in the mirror and you say, I look pretty good today. We look in the mirror and we see our reflection. Now, here's what I want you to do. Are you ready? You're going to have to do something. Are you ready? I want you to go ahead and pick up. Have you ever seen one of those mirrors you can hold in your hand? Pick up your mirror. Pretend like you have a mirror in your hand. Go ahead. Hold it up. You can do it too. Don't be embarrassed. You, you're a child of God. Hold up your mirror. Now look in the mirror. Look in it. Are you looking in the, You're looking at me. Look in the mirror. You look in the mirror and you see your reflection. Now here's what I want you to do. Just look at yourself and say, I am wonderful. Go ahead and say it. I am wonderful. God says you're wonderful. Now look in the mirror and say, I am marvelous. You are marvelous. All right, put your mirror down. You're getting too vain. God loves you, he created you, and you are wonderfully, marvelously made. Isn't that a mar remarkable? That's God's love for you and for me. Now, if you're wondering what that liquid is in there, it's just clear water that represents you and me. But something happened. In Genesis chapter 3, something came into this world, not by accident, but by choice. It wasn't of God's creative order, but something happened. Can anybody think what that is? Just say it out loud. Say it. Sin. You're right. Absolutely right. Sin came into the world. In Genesis chapter 3, you remember what took place. Adam and Eve were created. They were placed in, in a perfect environment called the Garden of Eden. But in the garden was a serpent. We know that serpent to be Satan. And the serpent came to Adam and Eve and tempted them and told them that they could, uh, they could be just like God and they liked what they heard. And Eve was fooled and she ate from the fruit. 
Adam, who received the, the word, uh, the command of God not to eat from the fruit of the tree of, no, of good and knowledge, or uh, of the knowledge of good and evil, Adam heard it from God's very lips, and yet he ate of the forbidden fruit. He disobeyed God. He believed Satan's word over God's word. And sin entered our existence by choice. Think about that. Sin entered. When you think about this second jar, it kind of represents sin. Sin doesn't look too good, does it? It doesn't look like something I'd want to drink. I don't know if you'd want to drink from it. It looks pretty nasty. Kind of black, almost crimson. It's different than the pure water that represents you and me. Sin had entered the world through Adam. In fact, the Word of God tells us this. Uh, when, when you think about this ugly thing called sin, Romans chapter 5, verse 12, Paul writes, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, because all have sinned. In other words, because Adam sinned at the very beginning, every single person in this room has one common denominator. We have sinned. For all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. We have sin in us. And that's a tragedy because God built us in a relationship with Him. You know what happened to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden? In, in uh, uh, Genesis chapter 3, they were dismissed. They were removed from God. God placed a cherubim, an angel with flaming swords to guard the entrance to the Garden of Eden. And they were removed from the very presence of God. In other words, this awful thing called sin separated man from God. Paul wrote this in, if he, or in uh, Romans chapter 6, verse 23. For the wages of sin is death. We'll get to the last part of that statement or that verse in a moment. You understand what wages are, don't you? When your parents go to work, they get paid for the work they do. They get wages. Well, the Bible says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Therefore, the wage that we must pay is death. Because sin entered this world, death entered the world with sin. And because through one man, Adam, the first Adam, sinned, death entered the world. So sin is in every person. And guess what? Every one of us is subject to death. So we've got you and me. And we've got sin. Because sin is now in us. When you think about that, doesn't look too potable anymore. Doesn't look like something you'd want to taste or drink. Sin corrupts us. Sin pollutes us. Sin makes us into something God never intended us to be. Sin separates us from God. So listen to this. Listen. Being born in this world, we are born already separated from God. So how do we get back to God? What is it that will bridge that, that, that separation from God? Well, that's the third jar. Are you ready for it? You already know because you've been studying about it for the last couple weeks. Jesus is the only one that spans that gap between God and man. He's the bridge that allows us to know God again. In other words... Jesus Christ came into this world and died for our sins. Let's go back to that verse we started with, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He gave his son Jesus to die upon the cross. I heard one of our, our children just uh, read a wonderful passage of scriptures, Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrates his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now think about this. Jesus Christ, the perfect son of God, God himself came from the very glories of heaven, put on mankind our flesh, but he was without sin. So that he could be amongst men, that he can minister to us, that he can raise people from the dead, that he can uh, heal the lame, that he can cause the demons to flee. 
But really he came so that he can die upon the cross at Calvary. And because he shed his blood, sin has been erased. Sin has been dealt the last blow. In other words, in Jesus Christ, there's victory over death. There's victory over sin. There's victory over Satan. Because Jesus didn't stay dead. Three days later, he rose from the grave. Isn't that good news? Because here's what happens. Jesus dying for our sins. Jesus dying for our sins. Built, uh, he, he knocked the victory blow against sin. Jesus got rid of sin. And that's such good news. But isn't there a problem here? Is there still sin? Where's, still si where's the sin now? It's in me and it's in you. In other words, what do we do? Well, the, the answer is real simple. We simply receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Repent of our sins. We tell God, you're right, I've been wrong. We repent of sin... And we take our belief in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And when Jesus comes into you and to me, he saves us from our sin. So when we ask Jesus to come into us, he saves us from our sins. And there is no more sin within us. Does that mean we're perfect? No. Does that mean we'll never do anything wrong? No. It means Jesus Christ has entered our life and now we can live for him because he has covered our sin. So next time you're in church and you hear that wonderful old hymn, what can wash away my sin? Well, it's nothing but the blood of Jesus. He died for you. He died for me so that our sins could be forgiven. That's what it means. That's what we've been studying for the last five weeks. That's how we build on the love of Jesus. When we first receive the love of Jesus into our hearts, and he forgives our sin. Here's what I'm going to do right now. I want us to go to the Lord in prayer. But the prayer is really simply this. If you have not asked Jesus into your heart, now's a great time for you to do that. If you've heard over the last five weeks about Jesus and you've, you've heard about how he saved us by dying for us, if you've heard about this Jesus who was buried in the tomb but then rose from the grave because he is God and he can save you today, then perhaps you'll want to say a prayer like the one I'm getting ready to pray. So I'm going to pray this prayer and if you believe you want Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you can say that prayer again, but say it in your heart for now. Because you can be saved. And then I'll tell you what you can do afterwards. And then I just want to pray for you. Let's all go to the Lord in prayer right now. Heavenly Father, we praise you this morning. We thank you, Lord God, for a dedicated group of people who wanted to spend each weekend for the last five weeks just to share with Jesus, uh, these children, not just fun and games and crafts and fun and learning wonderful songs to sing, but thank you, Lord God, that they were dedicated to teach them about the wonderful truths of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And Lord God, I'm going to ask these children right now to say a prayer, a prayer that can make an eternal difference for them. I'm going to ask them to repeat it after me in their hearts, not out loud, but simply repeat it if they believe God is calling, that you're calling upon them to pray. And so I'll ask them to pray right now. Heavenly Father, I know I'm a sinner. I repent of my sin and ask for your forgiveness. And I ask that your son... Jesus Christ will come into my heart and save me right now. 
Thank you, Lord God, for saving me. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Here's what I want to tell you. If you're a, an adult, if you're a child, if you prayed a prayer like that and deep in your heart you meant a prayer like that, God will save you. The Word of God tells us in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9 that when we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God promises, I will cleanse you. The Word of God promises, Jesus will save you. And so if you prayed a prayer like that and you're one of our children, here's what I want you to do. Talk to Miss Patricia. Talk to your parents. Come talk to me. And let us know about the decision that you made. And they will begin to talk with you about what you can do next. It's about receiving Jesus. And you cannot receive Jesus apart from his word. And apart from the Holy Spirit of God speaking to your heart. To move you in relationship with him. I'm going to go ahead and or we're going to go ahead and stand together. And we're all going to sing a, a hymn of dedication. A hymn of decision. And per Perhaps if you have a decision you have to make this morning or you believe you want to share with me, I'll be down front. I can pray with you. If it's a decision that needs to be made public, by all means, come to me and we'll talk about it. If one of you children or anyone else has received Jesus as their Lord and Savior, by all means, come forward and I can tell you what to do next. But with that in mind, let's stand together and Brother Harry's going to lead us. What is the hymn number? Hymn number 653. Let's stand together, let's sing, uh, and let's respond as God calls upon us to do so. I tell you, those kids just did wonderful. Why don't we give them a great big round of applause and thank them for leading us in worship this morning. You know, they want me to hurry up because downstairs I think they have pizza and stuff waiting. So I'm going to have about a 30-minute prayer right now, so until, at least till I hear their stomachs rumbling. I've been told that I'm on parking lot detail, so I have to hurry up and pray and get outside to make sure no one gets a wreck on the way home. Let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer and we'll be on our way. Heavenly Father, how blessed we are to be able to gather in your name. Thank you, Lord God, that you've given us a facility such as this where we can uh, spread out, where we can still uh, uh, ensure that we're being safe, but Lord God, where we can worship you in your house where you've called us to be. And so thank you, Lord God, for the blessing of these children being before us today. Thank you for the wonderful songs that they led us in. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for the prayers that have been lifted, for all the wonderful va uh, Vacation Bible School workers. And thank you, Lord God, for your precious word and your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. 
I pray that as we go our way, that you will place people in our lives that we can share Jesus with, that we can be the witness that we're called to be. I pray for these children as they begin to go uh, back to school, for some of them who are already back in school. I pray that they can be a wonderful witness of, of the love that they learned about Jesus, that they can be a wonderful witness to people within their schools and those that they come in contact with. Again, what a blessing it is to, to worship you. For it's in the precious and powerful name of Jesus we pray. Amen. God bless you. I hope you have a great day. We do have a deacon's meeting downstairs. Here at FBC Florence, we're a family, and we'd like to thank you for joining our family for worship this morning. This broadcast is made possible by the generous and loving contributions of the members and friends of First Baptist Church of Florida.